Man-made news rolled on with nobody very interested in it. We had a phone-in section of the show where viewers were supposed to ring in, but nobody rang in. Eventually, I had to go into another room and use the office phone and pretend to be random members of the public. I had an Iraqi character who never understood anything that Diamond said and who wound him up terribly. We never told him that all the phone calls were fake. It just would have been too cruel. When the series ended, the whole thing was just quietly wound up. This was bad news for me, as it meant that I'd probably be getting my marching orders. I started filming as much stuff as I could before I lost access to equipment. I made a little series called Snapshots that mainly consisted of me, dressed as a giant cat, chasing Lee Francis, dressed as a giant mouse, in and out of cheese shops in central London. Nobody was very interested in these, and I was getting desperate when salvation came in the form of a man called Dan Brook. Dan was from an advertising background and had been brought in to promote the Paramount Comedy Channel. He had the idea that, rather than use his budget to pay for advertising, he could finance me to do funny stuff that would get the channel publicity for what it was supposed to be. Funny. He called me in. Could I get the channel into the news? Oh yes, I replied, with the confidence of a man who'd personally spoken to Mr Gund. Go and do it, he said. So I did. My first target was Peter Mandelson, the slimy mastermind behind the New Labour project. Mandelson was known as a master of the dark arts, and so I thought it might be fitting for him to have a large following in the underworld. London at large informed us that Mandelson was due to attend the opening of some modern trendy furniture shop in Tottenham Court Road that very week. This was only two minutes' walk from our offices. It was fate. We dressed up as Frankenstein's monster, the Grim Reaper, assorted vampires, and the devil himself. Then we booked a paparazzo to turn up and take the pictures. There was no point in doing a publicity stunt without documenting the thing properly, and you couldn't rely on someone else capturing it. It all went too well. Mandelson turned up on time and was greeted by us like a fifth beetle. He looked most confused and fled into the store. We tried to follow him in, but were prevented by security. We then pressed ourselves up against the shop windows, screaming our appreciation of him like maniacal teeny bopper fans. When he eventually exited, we threw black confetti at his feet and all tried to hug him. The money shot was the moment he got back into his chauffeur-driven jag, and he froze at the door, surrounded by this chaos. The following morning, the photograph was on the front page of The Guardian, and the Paramount Comedy Channel was credited as being responsible. We'd hit a rich scene with Mandelson, as all the newspapers hated him and longed for anything to splash on him. I found out where he lived by going through every name in the Kensington and Chelsea Electoral Register. It took me ages, and I couldn't find it. Then I checked the Westminster roll, and eventually, there he was. The house itself was the one that would later get him into trouble, because he purchased it using an interest-free loan from a political colleague. We arrived early one morning and planted a mock Millennium Dome in his front garden. This made the headlines again. We were certainly on a roll. Next, I had a 30-foot statue of Mandelson made, and we erected it overnight on College Green in front of Parliament, before 12 of us carried it through London's Trafalgar Square and then tried to donate it to Mandelson's Millennium Dome exhibition. The number of people who were watching our little episodes was tiny, but they were quite influential. I met Noel Gallagher a couple of years later, and he told me that he and Liam used to avidly watch our stuff. We actually had a go at Liam. He'd been arrested after the Q Awards for possession of cocaine following a night out on the town. So we hired a really good lookalike and took him round all the places Liam had been the night before. We made him go in and apologise to confused receptionists and embarrassed owners for his behaviour. His final line was, Yeah, you didn't find any talcum powder here, did you? I left it somewhere. Liam had also challenged Mick Jagger to a fight in an interview, so we turned up at his North London house with 30 people wearing Mick Jagger masks and demanded that he come out and have a scrap. To our delight, he told us to fuck off on the intercom. One day we came into work to find that the new leader of the Conservative Party, William Hague, was having his stag party at the Carlton Club in Mayfair. We quickly organised some strippers and got to the event in time to bum-rush Haig as he arrived. All we had to do was turn up at a news event, do something funny, and the national news outlets would lap it up. It didn't matter if they knew why or what you were doing it for. I once chased Geoffrey Archer down the road dressed as a gorilla while I was throwing bananas at him. The redoubtable BBC and now Channel 4 News reporter Michael Crick chased me, having filmed the incident. He demanded to know who we were in his rather pompous manner. I didn't reply and he got increasingly irritated. 
If you don't tell me, then I won't use the clip on my report. I continued to ignore him and hurled one last banana at a retreating archer before hopping into the back of our vehicle and disappearing. The clip of our attack ran in full on Newsnight that evening with very little explanation. One day, Sam and I were walking down the Edgware Road in London when we saw a big display outside a mobile phone shop. One of the objects in the display was a two and a half foot plastic mobile phone. It was the Sony Mars bar, very fashionable at the time. Larking about, I picked it up and told Sam that I should use this as my new mobile. He laughed and I walked off still holding it in my hands. The shop owner then ran out and started chasing us, the thieves of his big plastic display phone. We scarpered, running as fast as we could while carrying our stupidly heavy booty. Eventually we hopped on a bus and made good our escape. We got off the top of Soho Square. It was pub time, but as we walked down Oxford Street, we spotted the larger-than-life, media code for fat, Australian DJ Jono Coleman being interviewed by a camera crew. Coleman was jabbering on, so I just acted instinctively. I got in the shop behind him, raised the big mobile to my ear, and started shouting into it. Hello! What? I can't hear you because that arse Jono Coleman is talking too loudly! It stopped traffic. Everyone on the pavement stopped and laughed. John O'Coleman stopped mid-flow and stared on in confusion, as did his camera crew. I continued. That's better! I can hear you now! The arts has stopped talking! No! I'm on the mobile! In Oxford Street! I wandered away from Coleman down the street, with Sam hooting with laughter and following me. The big mobile was born, although we wouldn't actually use it again for quite some time.